would be purely coincidental. Do bear that in mind. So, will you come play with us? You will? Good. I thought you would. Come in, cousins. Be one of the family. See here, Charles, do you realize what a dilemma this is? It's terribly difficult. I don't see any way out of it at all. Oh, come, 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 Bernard. Of course there's a way out. Now, there are 13 of us so far, right? You want to invite Edward as well, which makes 14. Yes, but if somebody's ill, Charles, then we should be back to 13 again. Precisely. Then we must invite more people. That's an idea. Now, what about Lottie and James? That'll make 16. Then if somebody's ill, well, at least we won't be 13, will we? Hmm, but then there's the problem of the rooms, Charles. Lottie has two children, Charles, two little boys, Freddie and little John. I don't see any problem there at all. We can put the two children in, well, in Helen's room, for instance. What do you think, Linda? Look, we're here, they're waiting for you. I think that... You see, Linda agrees with me. Lottie's children must go in with Helen. We can stop it there. Linda's absolutely right. But then there's the problem of the seating. The, uh, you can see Ray Bradbury invented uh, interactive television, flat screen monitors, uh, social networking, and, you know, in, you know, connected smart TVs in 1953. The movie was made a few years later in 1966. Um, and not only did he invent all those things and talk about them, he went a step further and made fun of them. And really the point of that movie was, yeah, all this silly stuff is coming, but really books are great stories. Great stories are always going to be what, what matter. Uh, if you remember the context of that movie is, uh, and that book was, you know, Fahrenheit 451 was a temperature at which books burn. The fire department was now, the sole purpose of the fire department was to find and burn books not to put out fires. So is, is, that, is that the case? Is it really, you know, is this all just gimmicky and are we going to be sitting here 50 years from now, 30 years from now, looking back and going, yeah, the way lots of neat gadgets and technology and whoop de doo really just comes, as we've all, you know, you all often hear, back to just a great story. Let's start with you, uh, James. I, I couldn't understand a word of those hoity-toity We need you to British translate accents. that for us. I have. What do you think, Glenda? Um, I, I've, I, found that, I found that very interesting. I mean, I think, I think uh, uh, partially we are um, sometimes, I think, in the broadcast media, certainly, uh, a little bit guilty of expecting that people will always interact with us, will um, stop our radio shows or our TV shows and say, oh, what do you think? Uh, and there's a wonderful, um, there's a wonderful comedy sketch um, uh, in the UK of somebody saying, uh, why don't you get in touch, tweet us or, or email us, don't let your ignorance be a bar. Um, and I think that's a wonderful thing because actually, frankly, um, the reason why some people are on the television, some people are on the radio, is that they're kind of experts and they do understand about these, these, these kinds of things and it's lovely hearing from, f f from, uh, from audiences, but sometimes we kind of go a little bit too far in that, in that interaction. And actually when you have a look at how people consume uh, content now, it's, it's a much more latent, it's a much more sit-back experience, even now, even in the age of the iPod and the uh, the iPad and the, uh, uh, and the mobile phone. Um, it's still very much, um, it's still an awful lot of consumption and we sometimes um, try and do a little bit too much interaction, I think. Justin, is the future of media a good book? Yeah, I was going to say, um, the only difference is um, instead of burning them, we scan them. Right? I mean, that's kind of what we've done. But that actually kind of leads to another interesting point. Like, um, you know, uh, if you guys know this guy, his name's John Philip Sousa. Do you know, do you guys remember who this was? He was like the Robbie Williams of the 1800s. Um, he wrote all the um, like big band carousel marching music and everything. But um, when he was uh, a popular musician, uh, this newfangled technology called the um, talking machine came out. Um, and it was what we know now as the record player. Um, <clears throat> and at the time, like it was the most revolutionary thing because it was the very first time anyone could actually store um, musical information, store content, and distribute it um, and replay it. And so there's this big congressional hearing in the States, this is like the late 1800s, and he's up there and he's saying, you know, in the olden days, we 
learned how to play and the songs of the day and the songs of the old, you know. And now with these infernal talking machines going on all the time, um, no one is creating anything anymore. They're just consuming things. And he said, he went so far as to say that the human will um, lose the vocal cords just as we lost the tail from the monkey. Um, and uh, that was his kind of concept. But if you think about all of the um, different forms of communication that we've created, they all don't require much talking, do they? I mean, the only thing that really requires talking these days is video teleconferencing or that kind of virtual conferencing stuff, right? You don't need a uh, voice for email, you don't need a voice for Twitter, you don't, and now we've gotten to the point where you can send 140 characters to 100 million people at the same time. So I always wanted to create this app for um, Twitter which was to calculate the carbon footprint of your Twitter you know, of your tweet? Is it really important for me and a thousand other people to hear how your coffee was this morning? You know, so I think, um, you know, there is a, there's a need for these kind of things to change moving into the future. But what I'd also say is I'd refute a kind of piece of this, which is with what's happening with social media, as we call it today, and it'll just become part of the vernacular in the future, the technologies, all these things are moving more towards interaction and allowing people to get more involved. So we're moving more from the lean back, right? Because that's what the record player was, from the talking machine all the way to the point of the internet, it's just been consumed content and iTunes hasn't necessarily helped that either because it's just consum consumption, but now we're getting to the point of lean leaning forward and engaging more. But vinyl's back. Absolutely. You know there's a machine at South by Southwest that um, could take your MP3s and cut a record. So um, it was, it's really cool. <laughs> yeah. So, so if magazine publishers just stick with it, it'll come back? The paper? Um, well, yeah. Well, I, 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 uh, no comment. <laughs> The, the, uh, and a related point to that, you know, one of the trends has been clearly moving away from a broadcast model to more of, you've heard the term unicast, it's a bit old now, but uh, uh, you know, the family no longer sits together in the living room watching the Cosby show, at least we hope they don't, uh, and, but, but individuals all have their own screens and are, and are consuming content that way. Um, is, that, is that one of the changes that's happening? Is, is the future really all about, you know, the Pandora, everybody's radio station is different uh, versus, you know, 88.1 FM, it's the same for everyone in Toronto. Uh, you know, want to comment on that, David? Well, I, I think um, the traditional shared experience has changed. Um, you know, the family get around, watch the Disney Sunday night movie has changed into how people consume their content differently, more of an on-demand PVR universe, and also people don't tell, you know, going back to the written word, people don't tell jokes anymore. Uh, you know, then email came along and or fa you used to fax jokes and email jokes. Now it's people share their, their they share video. And that's how they, sh that sharing experience has changed on a much larger level beyond just the family and the small circle at home to your entire circle of friends through Facebook and through whatever uh, formats that you can share content through and it tells your story and how that content engages with you. And I think people are identifying themselves by the content they consume and then sharing it with their friends. And I think a lot of it's on how they consume the media and how they share it. And that, so that brings up the point of, of niche, you know, uh, of niches and micro niches. And uh, there seems to be a growing trend in digital media certainly around, well, you know, don't just publish a music tablet magazine publish a tablet ma magazine about Norwegian, you know, metal, because that's how you'll get subscribers. Um, you know, the, the generic stuff isn't working, which kind of leads in a little bit into what you do, Jennifer, and the factual uh, programming is more about niches. It's more about specialty television in a way. If you look at how specialties exploded over the last several years, you know, I like Home and Gardens. Uh, you know, when, when Home and Garden and Food Network launched, I think a lot of people made fun of that and thought, well, that's not going to ever work. I mean, it's too narrow. But, but certainly, you know, now we're, you know, you're producing shows that are, you know, rather specific compared to the network model of, of old. Do you see that as, as a growing trend and an important trend as, as audiences become fragmented? You know, I think we've certainly seen over the last number of years more audience fragmentation than we've ever expected to see. But, but I actually still think there's family viewing. Certainly in the factual group, we actually target uh, the broadest possible audience we can in family viewing. And, and we still do see and believe that families gather on the couch and they watch, we know, they watch things like Dragon's Den and Battle of the Blades and Arctic Air and Amazing Race. We see the numbers, we know they do. 
What's exciting about where we're at right now is that there's also the virtual couch, if we want to call it. So I can be sitting watching Dragon's Den with my mother and my son, and I can be engaging in a conversation with the country, with my shared family of fans, about, um, uh, about what's happening and what I like in the show. I think for us as a modern public broadcaster, I would say that story is key, content is king in everything. That is the first and foremost. Create something that is great, that people want to see, and give it to them when they want to see it. And the second piece is, when it's authentic, I think where we've gotten into troubles with, um, with the interactive uh, part is when it's, it's inauthentic or we're forcing it. The second screen experience, where it's a natural experience, I think is really, uh, you know, we've seen it has um, done what we, we are, our mandate at, at the public broadcaster is to do, is to bring the country together in a conversation and allows us to do it. So in so many ways, where we're going is, has been a great benefit to us as a part of public broadcast. The only thing I wanted to add on that is that, you know, I think in the old model, content is king, but in, in the future of media, distribution is queen, and I think that's such an important thing mm -hmm. yep. with on demand and pushing the content yep. out. We can't fight that, I agree with you 100%. You, you have to listen, like I'd say two things, content's king and listen to your audience, which is that, right? You have to, you can't fight them or hold back on it, you have to give it to them when they want it, right? Which is why distribution is queen. There was, there was an interesting um, study in the UK where what they did was they called it um, kind of like um, they transported, it was called uh, teletransport, um, which was they took families that had no technology in there, you know, other than like, you know, a TV from 10 years ago, I mean, probably not even flat screen TVs. And then they completely redid their house. It was like, you know, renovation makeover kind of reality show, but no, for a research study. And it was like, they gave them every cable channel, every modern piece of technology, iPads, you know, everything. And they've monitored what the, because they really thought that TV viewing was going to go down. But in reality, TV goes up mm -hmm. because what happens is all of the other experiences surround that media consumption and they end up spending more time consuming media. But mm -hmm. um, I do agree with what you're saying, but the, the biggest issue is, you know, like I've got a friend who's got a teenage daughter and he was like, oh, let's sit down at 8.30 and watch the show. And, right. she, and he was like, dad, I've already seen all 14 episodes, you know. So it's like, you yeah. know, there's these different technology, technology and generation gaps to jump over. But like you said, give it to them now, like the media distribution, content turning mm -hmm. into media. Let's give uh, Jeff a chance to comment. Yeah, one of the, uh, the, the profound implications that we're, we're seeing out there is, is with respect to the type of content that gets made as a result of the fragmentation, and that's tied very much to the revenue model. So that the very high quality dramatic storytelling is, is definitely migrating to those, station, or those channels that have strong subscription revenues. And on the network side, I think what we're seeing is that the fragmentation and the reduction in the audience uh, to the point where it is, it's less than half of the viewing audience at this point, is, is unable to justify spending the money on the larger budget programming. So we see more of the reality in that that split is going to have interesting implications for the broadcasting system as revenue, uh, subscription supported specialty services that are catered to the niches uh, become a more important feature of the landscape where the additional choice is provided by penny a pound content um, on, on some of the networks. The, um, there's a, you guys raised a, a bunch of interesting points there. I want to uh, pick up on all of them, but let's start with, um, you talked about generational gap. I think it even goes beyond that. The digital content divide uh, is significant. I think um, Pew Research, these guys put out a report a little while ago, commenting on the difference between urban and suburban residents in terms of smartphones, tablets, and all that kind of stuff. And you know, it kind of seems like common sense, but they concluded that urban folks are twice as likely to have these fancy devices. Um, and yet, the other things go, show content viewing and consumption skyrocketing on these devices and plateauing on, on uh, more traditional uh, you know, platforms. Is there a media divide coming where it's literally two different media consumers, not just by age, but by geography, by income? Are we creating you know, an urban media consumer which is totally and completely different than the, than the one in Sudbury? Um, you know, James, maybe you can... Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a real issue. And I think if there's no 3G or 4G where you live, if the internet's so slow you can't use Netflix uh, on it, for example, I think that that's more concerning than, 
than just our world of the media. I think that actually cuts people off from the economy as well. Um, I mean, I, I think we're moving into a world with haves and have-nots in terms of connectivity, and it, it, it's, it's fascinating. My main business is running a website. Now, I can run a website pretty well anywhere on Earth, uh, as long as there's internet access. And I know that there are quite a few people who travel the world doing exactly that, running, running websites, doing uh, jobs that they can actually do from the end of, from the end of an internet c connection. Now, if I go somewhere where there is no internet, then I cannot function, and I can't function in terms of the economy as well. So from my point of view, um, one of the most important things in terms, of, uh, in terms of where we're headed is making sure that everybody has access to uh, fantastically nice, fast internet and that that internet isn't uh, censored in any way, and that that internet ideally isn't metered in any way. Um, because if you're on the end of a metered connection, if you're on the end of a connection which is too slow for live, for live media, for example, and only works for very slow on-demand downloads and things, then actually that, that really does change the whole relationship that you have. There just to dig a little bit further into that, let's say everybody does have the high speed access. Is there a lifestyle difference that, that will create different opportunities? You know, I think one of the funny things about radio uh, that I understand, as I understand it, I'm not a radio guy, but it's, it's, the, it's the old media that keeps on giving in Canada. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's a, it's a great business to be in here. Uh, I wonder, is that... Is that really going to fall off a cliff one day, or is, it, is, there, is there a lifestyle difference of, you know, in, in geographically based or income based, where you don't have 18 devices, or you don't care about, you know, cross-platform this and that, and you just, you, you just, you know, radio is going to be popular and interesting for a long time. They've been calling the death of radio for like 30 years. It's like yeah. every time I sit down at CMW, it's a death of radio, death of radio, death of radio, and it's the only medium that's flat. Yeah. You know, from an advertiser perspective, and, and I mean, certainly Cume has gone down a little bit, but with Sirius, et cetera, but I, I, I think radio is, is here to stay, period. It's just a question of how it's consumed, not what device it's used on. The, uh, one of the, the critical differences between radio and, and audiovisual content that, uh, that we might see has been the, the proliferation of, of audiovisual services like Netflix or like Apple have really only taken off since people were able to get you know a five megabit uh, per second uh, internet connection at a, at a price point that is what we used to get you know a 256 or whatever at that price point for connectivity is not there in wireless uh, and we can we can have a discussion as to whether the environment is competitive enough to get us there but. I think the tipping point in radio, if it comes, will come uh, as a result of getting inexpensive wireless connectivity into the car uh, at price points that people are willing to, to actually consume it. And I'm not sure that we're there in Canada yet. One of the other um, <clears throat> things you guys brought up in the discussion was around subscription revenue. Obviously, there's a lot of talk about what, what does the future media look like when the, the subscription revenue falls out of the television business, the cable business, or if, if there's downward pressure on price, or if everything is free on the internet? But now we have this emerging world of apps and in-app purchases and micro-niche subscriptions and paywalls that are starting to do well um, in some very rare, incredibly rare instances. Um, 20 years from now, let's fast forward. Everyone has nice connectivity. The, uh, does a household subscribe, do they have a $150 content subscription? Or do they have 150 different $1 content subscriptions? Just want to hear your thoughts, your perspectives. Uh, yeah, so um, I have um, a proposal to make about what that future will be uh, that far down the line. I hope that it comes even sooner than that. And you see some of these things kind of starting to happen today. So let me take you through an example. So let's say, you know, um, I don't know if you, any of you experienced the um, metal shredding guitar head guy playing in the, um, underneath the railroad uh, yesterday. Has anyone uh, walked past that guy? Well, anyhow, so um, he's down there shredding metal, so he's probably not like the best person for this. Let's think of someone like, you know, a tenor sax player or something on the street corner making some nice music. So lots of times people will walk by that guy and drop like a coin or something into his, um, you know, hat or whatever. 
Um, so that, like where I come from, they call that busking. I don't know, do they call that busking here? Okay, cool. Um, where I come from now, they didn't call that, that in the US. But, so um, how come there's no such thing as virtual busking? Right? I mean, when I look at YouTube and I see like the free hugs campaign, like do you guys know that free hugs thing? That guy had like 90 million views, his, his name's Juan. Um, and I know him, he, was, he started this in Sydney. Over 90 million views and he got like the, a friend of his to put a mu some music on. The, the band got a single record deal and didn't do so well, um, but he didn't make a single penny out of it, and the band didn't necessarily make a single penny out of it. No one understands that as a user, uh, that user-generated content has rights to manage, and everyone gives their rights away for free. So as we move into the future, people that generate content without a studio, without the whole chain of production, with all the things that go through that, where there are people that manage rights and manage them so that people can have successful business. Once this comes to the people, then the whole world will move to this new paradigm. So like you were saying, 150 um, one dollar subscriptions, I don't think there'll be any subscriptions. I think it'll be, I'm interested in that piece of content. Um, maybe I'll make a donation, maybe there's a minimum donation, maybe this is a piece of content that someone's giving away for charity and everything that I give to them goes to that charity. So there's a whole different ecosystem out there in terms of how those types of content will change the face of the way that people interact with and share content. So I'd just stick my neck out early and tell you kind of what I thought might be I, I think you just told everybody in the room that they're out of a job. <laughs> I think they including, uh, including myself. So you know. I, my prediction is that uh, in 15 to 20 years, Rogers becomes a utility, um, and Xbox or PlayStation takes over the living room. They've already got the devices there. They're in 70 percent of homes already. They become the content curator, um, and there's a one set fee for a million channel universe versus a thousand channel universe. And why would they be a curator? Why wouldn't they just be an open platform? Well, they're, they're still, I, th I think people still want some sort of curation. So it'll be a comedy channel with Funny or Die, Call of Humor, and all the comedy stuff on the net available. But the same way that YouTube's beginning to curate it into channels. I get it, but, but what, that's not necessarily Microsoft. They could just be selling the hardware and the platform. We could be building an app that's the comedy Yeah, app. I think they're going to do the deals and be able to put the channels together with all the content creators. Do you think that's long-term going to be I, the same? I think it's going to be sooner than 50. I mean, I think part of, part of this actually is making sure that it's really easy and really simple. I am not going to give my credit card details to 150 different people just for a little bit of content. You only have to give it to Apple. Um, no, no. <laughs> if I only give it to Rogers or I only give it to Bell, well, that, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of a step. Because actually, when you start having a look at Apple, when you start having a look at what uh, Google is trying to do with Google Play and so on, that all of a sudden makes it far easier for me to go, you know, I think this content might be worth 10 cents, 20 cents, $1, $2. Uh, and I think that that's, that's interesting. The other side of that coin is, I think that people are more and more used to getting content for free and not seeing any value around what content they're consuming. And I think that's a real worry in terms of clearly the music industry, but I think more and more uh, the book industry, the, the journalism industry, uh, and, the, and the film industry. Because I, I think that um, young people who are growing up right now see all of that kind of media as it's free and I can get hold of it, and it actually doesn't really have a value. And that's a real concern as we move forward. I notice the irony of that sometimes in line at coffee shops and talking to people in line and they're fretting over the $1.99 app purchase. And you're like, well, what are you going to order? A oh, latte. How much? $4.50. Uh, you know, it, it's 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 odd. People do do put more weight on that. I, I think it's I think it's an ecosystem filled with different models. Honestly, I really do. I don't think the Googles and the Apples they're not going anywhere. They're going to exist, and I really do still think that down the road, that shared collective experience. Me speaking as a TV person, and especially a factual, unscripted entertainment person. Um, uh, there's a need for it and a desire for that. That something's actually happening. Um, that you is happening live in that moment, that you're part of a conversation. We did a, a, a new game show on Sunday called Canada's Smartest Person. So it was an original format, as we always do at the CBC, and uh, reimagining intelligence. And, and we had an, this incredible play along experience for people at home. And it was, I have to say, I was very heartened by it because you could see it, so we trended all across. Um, 
uh, Canada on Twitter, which is hard to do, to break through the din of all of the various shows. It was, you know, not always easy. But I think it sort of spread across because people actually had this, they could compare each other, you know, I did better in this, how did you do? There was, you know, little mini games spreading out across the country. And so I think that wherever we go, that type of experience will exist. And, and that, and, but why wouldn't that be uh, just through Facebook? or through your new smart TV that has Facebook overlaid on top of your TV show? Like, why, why does that have to be sitting together and watching a show? Well, I'm not sure how the distribution will be, and it could be both, right? It could be th through the traditional distribution of television. It could be on Facebook. I think that certainly what we do, our content is, because we create it and own it, is available everywhere. You can watch it online. You can uh, download an app. You can see it. You can DVR it, et cetera. So I think it could, I think it'll be multiple ways. I think part of what we have to do in the television industry is don't fight it, is just move with it. We have to be incredibly nimble. So that, uh, that aggregation function probably will still be with us in 20 years. I'm cynical that we're going to overcome customer inertia to the point where algorithms and, and friend recommendations and, and platforms are what people will use to get their content. I think what I'm looking at at work is who that aggregator is going to be. Uh, is that aggregator going to be a Canadian aggregator or is it going to be a, a global aggregator and that's going to depend on how the program rights markets shake out over the next few years? You know, one way to protect <coughs> our industry and our jobs is regulation, is to ensure that there's some sort of uh, mandated role for the cultural industries in Canada. Uh, you know, one could argue that the extreme view is that, you know, in order to protect that sort of cultural sovereignty, one, one should stifle innovation in a way in, in foreign entrants that have built the next great over-the-top platform or the next great Pandora and make it hard for them to come in because that protects our jobs and protects our cultural sovereignty. What, what is the CRTC going to do about all this? In a... Um the traditional approaches have been very protectionist and have taken place in a, in, a, in a closed context. So our approaches are based on giving people permission to broadcast to Canadians in return for extracting some kind of an obligation, be that a contribution to subsidy funds or be that a certain amount of Canadian content. And that's worked really well in a closed system. But when you take a look at the implications of what trying to protect Canadian broadcasters are in an open environment in which Canadians have, uh, you know, built Netflix into what, a hundred and five million dollar business uh, almost overnight. Uh, they have an appetite for content that is coming from around the world and where global providers want to make content available to Canadians. I think Canadians have an expectation and a reasonable one that they'll be able to get it. The implications of trying to stifle that kind of innovation um, uh, our concern, I think, to Canadians, the idea that, for example, a Netflix might be blocked if it doesn't abide by a Canadian content uh, regulation is uncomfortable for a lot of Canadians. So right now, we are trying to figure out what are we going to do about it, and that's what keeps us up at night. What are the new approaches that don't depend on permission in, in an environment that is open to global providers to serve Canadians? Uh, what, it, what is that? Is it, it's probably not creating the Great Firewall of Canada. On the other hand, the CRTC doesn't have funds that we can throw at problems. Um, so the question will be, how are we going to ensure that Canadian content gets made when we don't have pots of money to throw at it? And at this point, we are still listening to potential solutions. Now that said, um, the Canadian broadcasting system is still very strong today. So I'm not sure that there's a, a huge rush to get to that solution. If you want a really va relaxing vacation, go to Cuba. You can't access your BlackBerry, Facebook, anything at all, and, and that's regulated. The, um, <clears throat> Jeff, you successfully answered my question with a question. You have a great future in, in the government. <laughs> the, the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, we have, you know, I want to go back to this idea of, you know, the industry and what Justin was saying that, you know, it's, it's gone. It's, it's all about dare I say, user-generated content, what a, a terribly uh, uh, old term, but it, it's all about empowering individuals and individual creators, not just anyone with a cat and a skateboard, but journalists and 
videographers and, and to, to go direct. The promise of the internet or the, even the information superhighway was always about empowering the desktop publisher. Um, is that we finally come of age there and where anyone can publish great content and content greatness is no longer determined by the size of the company that made it. Um, if that's the case, what is the role of the industry and, and is the consolidation for example we're seeing in Canada where Bell buying Astral and all these things becoming more consolidated, is that just a symptom of that and ultimately the industry is going to shrink and if you have these individual creators and maybe one or two leftover behemoths, you know, at the end of the day who can, who'd make the really big budget stuff. Uh, is there, what happens in the middle? Where do you go from being an individual creator? Can you grow? Is there, is there a role for an independent media company, a small media company in this, in this future? Yes, yeah, so I, maybe to answer your question, I'll start by asking a question, which is, um, is uh, the industry a business or is it a community? You know, if you think, if you frame it as a business, then you think of it as something with lots of regulation, hierarchy, structure, divisional power, information power, blah, 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 go on, go on. Whereas if you think of it out as a community, a community of people that are generating content for the consumption for other people to enjoy, entertainment, et cetera, whatever it might be, then I think that completely reframes your question. And it makes you think of, um, instead of the boundaries and the, con the, the containers that we're all stuck in today, we think about what's the future of that and we think of more like networked community, yeah? And so lots of companies more, uh, let's say lots of dot-com kind of companies can do this, you know, as mentioned before, companies that are you know, a few people loosely clad operating out of Starbucks in four different countries at the same time, you know? Um, these are networked organizations. They don't fall into divisional or functional structures. They fall into a network. And actually, they say that if you're, um, this is one of those statistics, you know, 72.4% of statistics are made up on the spot. Did you know that? Um, and um, they say that about, um, if you're over 30, I think this was about five years ago, I read this in some Harvard Business Review, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you're um, like 30 on that day, then over 50% of your professional life as, you know, career life um, will be as an independent consultant. You might not be that person right now, but by the time you're 50 or 60, you'll probably be independent and you'll be working with a loosely clad group of people to produce a product, a brand, a service, a piece of content, whatever it might be. So I think that if you rephrase that and think of it as we're a community of people that are artists and producers and content creators that are working together to create new and interesting pieces of content, then yes, you have people that do it as user-generated content. You usually think of one person, maybe two or three. Somebody's got to hold the camera. And then you think of a little bit larger, which is the kind of sweet spot that you're talking about. I think that they'll find, there'll be a market efficiency where there's a point where you have the right amount of people to produce a project. Yeah, Jennifer, when you're commissioning a... <coughs> $200,000 an episode series. Mm -hmm. Is there any little thing in the back of your mind thinking, ah, two guys in Montreal in a garage can make an extreme cooking show that's just as popular as this for 300 bucks? <laughs> we take pitches from two guys in a garage who've got cooking shows. We take pitches from them and we take pitches from big uh, production companies. An idea, a good idea is a good idea. And then we make sure, I like your vision of the world and that's the vision of the world that we live in. It's a community of partnerships. We are constantly, I mean the first partnership starts with the independent producers. So the people that I'm looking at in the room right here, the people who come to us with ideas. So it starts there. And then there are, you know, we, we work with financing partnerships and then there's distribution partnerships with, you know, uh, Netflix and Rogers on Demand and all those sorts of things. And then when it warrants it, we do other media partnerships like, um, you know, the National Post or something. So I, I really do think that it is case by case. You collect up the people who are right for that community to make an idea sing. So that's... And if I might even add, then what happens in this ecosystem moving forward is if you've got the ability to prov provide micropayments to people and like let's say it's music or it's video, whatever it might be, what ends up happening is the data drives this in the future, right? So I mean, I the question is, how is the money made? I mean, a lot of people say, what is the future media? But it's often determined by how the money is made, how the advertising comes into play, and, and what really a lot of people care about is, how do I make money from my content? Where's my money? Where, do, where am I going to make money in this future? The, the, uh, we're getting close to the end time here, so I'd say uh, 
as we do the last couple of questions, if you have questions out there, just go stand behind the mic so I know you've got one. Um, and, uh, and we'll get to you in, in, uh, in a minute or two. But I want to pick up on that, David. Um, the, uh, we've already determined, we've already settled the fact that subscriptions are gone. There's no future in subscription revenue, so that part of our industry is going to fall through the floor. I, I, would, I would argue, just in case where you've got a golden egg like UFC pay per view and things, something like that. Okay, uh, but let's talk about advertising. Because if the subscription revenue is gone, everybody's chasing the mighty ad dollar. We all hear about, read about, well, you know, with this pro proliferation of content creation and quality content creation and social media, there is an oversupply of ad inventory in general in the world that is only going to become more apparent as time goes on. Oversupply, but the same demand. There's not all of a sudden way more companies out there spending ad dollars. Natural like, economics 101, price goes down. It's already started to happen. Uh, CPMs are, are going way down. So now we've lost our subscription revenue and we're losing our ad revenue. And now everyone's chasing the branded entertainment. Okay, well, we'll forget about all that. We're, I'm going to go straight to the brand and I'm going to make great content for them and cut out the middleman. Is that also, I mean, is that sustainable? And what is that, where does that leave the rest of the creative world that doesn't want to do, make, write their next song for Coca Cola? Well, I think we're, <clears throat> I mean, we're so far behind in Canada on this note to start with. I mean, we represent a lot of U.S. partners, Funny or Die, College Humor, who garner 70% of their ad dollars from branded content. And in Canada, most of the broadcasters, their former branded content is a very traditional television model where it's sponsorship or, or integration, but it's not where the story is created from, from the brand. Um, you know, in, in the U.S., IP isn't as important. It's about getting the content bringing them out to Muhammad, getting the content out to the viewers as much as possible. And that's kind of a purest form of branded content. And I think that, you know, so there's, I think there's a massive opportunity in that area. I think also the ad supply, I mean, the digital industry is growing by 20, 25% per year. That pie may not be growing any smaller or bigger, um, but the dollars are moving from traditional media over to digital. So I think, I, I'm not seeing a huge decline in CPMs yet. Justin, in the future, will, will uh, the best creators in the world work for the uh, CBC or for Procter & Gamble? Um, I think it's completely the wrong model to look at these things in the structures that exist today. Um, we went from, in the, in the past, you had to pay for stuff. Now, with the internet and Google and stuff, you get it for free, right? And another model happened. So why, why not, why did you, we not get paid as consumers for, for, being, for giving people our data. If everyone thinks about the information that they have, which is valuable to people that are producing products and services, which is all of our clicks, all of the places that we visit, how long are we watching these things, we give all this stuff away for free right now, right? If we move into a model where no, we don't. We don't give it away for 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 a free. We get services like uh, like Google out of it. And we get services like Gmail, and we get paid um, in terms of uh, the services that we end up that we end up uh, using. We also get paid, by the way, in terms of cutting down the amount of irrelevant advertising that we right, see. Right. I, I I am not in the market for a new pair of tights or for a new skirt. At least not during the week. So therefore, <laughs> so therefore, I shouldn't. You're still awake. Brilliant. Um, so therefore, I shouldn't. I shouldn't see any of that stuff. Um, advertising, which is just irrelevant, is just an annoyance. Advertising, which is relevant to me, is content, and that's stuff that I actually really want to see. Um, agreed. But I think that it's probably a minority view. Um, which, by the way, let me get your number after this. No, just kidding. Um, but. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, I think it's a minority thing. So what I'm saying is like, you know how like people have ad blockers today online so I don't have to see these ads and don't serve me any of this and blah, blah, blah. Um, why not have an intelligent ad blocker that says if you pay me a tenth of a cent for every ad you serve me, then I'll let you serve me ads. They do that in social gaming already today. Yeah, in so, gaming I mean, In gaming do. you've got, you know, it's like I choose, I want this next right. cool thing in my game. I elect to watch this ad. Exactly. So exactly. there's already a pay for play model going right. on now. Yeah. So imagine those kind of these smaller things becoming a larger um, focus of. And so what I'm saying is the models will morph 
right? As things change, um, generationally, I know we were talking about, I, don't, I agree it's not like exact demographics, but it's more general, generationally in terms of your understanding of technology and how you use it and all that. So it's different ways that that works. But I think that the models will shift. So an innovationist and a futurologist walk into a stocking shop. <laughs> you write the punchline. The, uh, we've got a question out here, which I, I think is going to be, it's going to sum this entire panel up perfectly. I hope so. My name is Conrad. I'm with gtfilmscores.com. My question is, uh, how are illegal downloads shaping the future of media? How are illegal downloads? Yeah, because you can get your TV, movie, music content all for free from torrents, uh, new programs that replace things like Napster. So I'm going to rephrase it a little bit because I don't want to get stuck, uh, stuck in the present because we are talking about the future. Think about this and again with your 20-year glasses on. Uh, what, what did all that illegal stuff that was happening back then, is it still happening? Has it changed the shape of media? Jeff? From my perspective, it makes access to content uh, that is tied to a cable subscription, uh, which is the current model that's being proposed by cable companies, uh, very uh, difficult, very challenging. If I don't need a subscription to subscribe to an HBO Go, for example, or to subscribe to Rogers On Demand because I can get the content for free, that takes a big tool out of the toolkit of the cable companies as they try today to respond to the OTT uh, developments that they're seeing. Do, when you get a hit show, Jennifer, do you worry about this, that people no. are going to watch it for free? No, we illegally? give it for free. With uh, Dragon's Den, and we even do it, we were, I think, the, the first in Canada with uh, Dragon's Den again because we know we have a rabid fan base there, so we gave it out before the show even aired on television. So we're all about, you know, where you go, you come to our site or you go to our app, and then there's advertising there, so it's not... So, free, so you're hoping illegal downloading just becomes legal somehow by embedding well, ads? That's, that's exactly it. We want to... We want to not fight. If we fight it, then there will be the illegal downloads. If we figure out a way to give it out for free but still make money for it, that's where the... Yeah, I mean, I think the movie is. industry um, has been really smart about that, about teasing the content leading to that golden egg. UFC is incredibly smart about it, leading to the golden egg. That's why they become a billion dollar company in less than you know, well, think, five years. Well, think, um, but the music industry, you know, I think it's more... For the music industry, at least, uh, for the artists, it comes down to more about merch performance versus you know, making songs and getting label deals. You know, I'm not sure. I think it, I think it actually comes down to the user experience as well. So um, the, reason, the reason why Napster was so successful is two reasons. Firstly, because it had every song. And secondly, because it was really easy to end up using. Spotify has hmm, most of the songs, and it's pretty easy. And that has um, meant uh, a, a, a much less... Uh, pirating, but Spotify doesn't have every single song yet because there are some stupid-headed people who think that actually it makes sense to hide their songs from Spotify so that people illegally download them instead. Brilliant plan. Um, so actually, it, it does, I think, come down to exactly uh, how easy you make it to consume your content and make that content available. And I, this is totally unrelated, but I just received a text message from my wife saying the cat has taken a crap on my side of the bed. <laughs> <coughs> I, I'm going to take that as a sign that this panel is about to wrap up. Um, uh, it's like... Uh, the, um, one last statement. I see there's no more questions, and if there are, run up there, because we've got time maybe for one or two more. But I'm going to take the final statement from each of you. I want you to take your official hats off, your Google hats and CRTC and CBC hats mm -hmm. off, and, 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 but talk about your business and your company in the sense of what is the one thing your organization or people in your industry should be way more focused on tomorrow than they are as this all unfolds and as the disruption takes place. Jeff? So taking off my CRTC hat, um, which is difficult for a as a citizen to of do. Canada, what should the CRTC yeah. do? I think one of the uh, one of the areas as we're less focused on micromanaging an industry so that everybody gets a fair share of the pie, uh, which will become an increasingly ten uh, untenable proposition moving forward in in the long term. Uh, we need to be more focused on on the consumer and ensuring that they're protected. The services and products that we're talking about are very complex. We're talking about micropayment systems that could potentially be offered by any number of folks. I'd like to see more thought given to protection of the consumer in a very complex environment. Uh, I think the user experience is key. I think there is nothing, uh, uh, there's nothing clever technologically about the Apple iPhone, 
fundamentally. It's the user experience that makes that product a brilliant product uh, in comparison to the old clunky things that we used to have from Nokia and Motorola and so on. If we as media people don't get the user experience right uh, in the way that people consume our media, then we are screwed. I do, I do want to just quickly pick up on that. I mean, let, can we not assume in 20 years, 30 years that all the remaining media players have figured that one out? Like, what, what is then the differentiator? What if the user experience is like super simple for everything everywhere? I think that would be a, a, a lovely thing, and in which case um, I'd be really happy t to get proved wrong. I, I, just, I just see time and time again from brand new products how clunky and rubbish the user experience is. No, no I'm, I'm pushing you to the next set. Let, let's say all those bad user experience companies have gone out of business, which I you know, agree with. So the remaining guys all have fantastic user experiences. How do they differentiate themselves? I'm, I'm not sure we'll get to um, okay. somewhere, so I'm, I'm going to... to um, Decline to answer that, but thank you for asking. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer? You know, for, sitting here right now, I'm trying to think of what is the one thing, and I, and I guess it is um, for us in the TV business, we're at such a great place right now. I feel certainly at the CBC where we are, um, we're not fighting it, and we're not afraid of it, and we are embracing it, and we are nimble. And I guess always, I, as I sit here, I feel like the things that are coming at us, and it is the instinct to always have the, you know, we've got such a smart team of people that I, I work with and I'm grateful f for that um, because it is happening so quickly and I guess my fear is always can we stay on top of it? Are we always going to be able to be ahead of it so that they, we're serving the audience the content that we want and that TV is still relevant and in the game? David, I'll take this opportunity to point out what I'm sure everyone in the audience is already thinking about, and that is the fact that you're the only panelist whose name doesn't start with J. Um, and, and therefore, the pressure is on. Three minutes. Everything you do has to be in three minutes. You have to create the con uh, not that you have to create it, but it should be no longer than three minutes long. Um, it should be, you know, Canada is not creating for short form content. Everything consumed, 80% of what's consumed online in the digital world is three minutes long. Um, they should, you know, distribute it in three minutes, get it out there as fast as you can. Um, and that is the future because, you know, my business is based on three minutes. Uh, all the content, I mean, and unfortunately, you know, there's a real shortage, fortunately for me, of short form content in Canada. Um, and if we don't start producing short form content in Canada, we're losing all the eyeballs south. Uh, and the production, you know, and I, I've, I've posed this question to a lot of Canadian broadcasters. and they're still in the 99% world of long-form content. Justin, you get the last word. Re Real-time, data-driven insights. So I think that's what, I'm back to your orig original question, which was, you know, people within my organization, or I think in any organization, the three minutes thing makes a lot of sense. Some places it'll be better than others. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, actually do the three-minute thing is that what everyone wants? Yes, then move towards it. You use that as the insight and move, you know, make that. But what I think is there's so much data out there and no one's doing anything with it. Most people get all this data. No one even looks at their web analytics, you know, because maybe the website's not the piece of, the, you know, the prime piece, the prime mover in their business. But the ability to see these insights and do it in real time is going to be what um, pushes the future of the kind of work that we all do. Um, and I think that being able to extract those insights, that's the part that's still, it's, it's, a massive, it's a massive problem. And no one's actually doing it too well yet. And it's one of the things that lots of people are spending lots of time trying to figure out how to do, because it changes all the time. So I think there's a lot of challenge there. So for example, you know, there's some tools out there you can use right now. There's like this thing that's called um, uh, Google Insights for Search or something, right? You can put it in any search term and it'll show you what people are doing. Are they, is it a trend up? Is it a trend down? So in Australia, there's a didgeridoo, you know, that's a musical instrument like the long didgeridoo the Aboriginal people play. Well, it turns out that there's a small city in Austria in the middle of Europe that once a year goes nuts for didgeridoos. Um, and it's like you would never know this unless you saw the data, and it's because they have this big didgeridoo festival. So if I was a hand making hand making, uh, if I was making handmade didgeridoos in Australia, I've got a business waiting for me in Austria. You know, the didgeridoo is how we wrap it all up. There you go. There's there's the retro content, uh, you know, focus there. Uh, I, I am out of time, right? There's no more time for questions. Uh, is there any more questions?
No, no more questions. So th panelists, thank you so much. It was fantastic. And thanks for coming.